Well, hello there. Welcome back to another episode of Just in Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to take a journey through the world of agile world building. This is the approach that I use, borrowing from the principles of agile software development to build out my worlds. It's an iterative, adaptive process that involves a whole lot of exploration and creativity. The name of this channel, Just In Time Worlds, is a nod to the concept of just in time delivery that underlines the agile methodologies of software. So rather than trying to map out everything in advance, we build and discover our worlds just in time as the story unfolds. It's my homage to the agility and adaptiveness that forms the core of this world building process. So let's dive in. The first thing we need to do is define the actual agile process. Agile development originally came from software development, and it is a set of principles for incremental and iterative work. In traditional or waterfall development, you'd have all the specifications detailed up front and then build everything in one go. Agile, in contrast, embraces change and evolution where you create a basic version, then continuously improve and expand it in response to feedback and changing requirements. Similarly, agile world building involves building the world as you go, typically starting small, a single city, or even just a neighborhood, and then gradually expanding from there. This isn't just about geographic expansion, it's also about depth. As I delve more into my story, I find new elements to define and expand on, like local traditions, historical events, specific cultural quirks. Now, you may wonder, how does this work in practice? At the beginning of my process, I have an initial document, a kind of world Bible, if you will. It's usually just a thousand words or so, sketching out the fundamental characteristics of the world the races, the tech level, the magic system, and so on. Then, as I write the story, I let the narrative guide the world building. If my plot needs a bustling port city, then I'll define trade routes, key exports and imports, and local guilds. If a character develops an interest in arcane history, I'll flesh out the world's ancient civilizations and their magical practices. This way, I'm not spending time on world-building elements that my story doesn't need. Just as software development focuses on delivering the most value to the end user, agile world-building focuses on what is most important to the reader. The reader needs a coherent and immersive world that supports and enhances the narrative. They do not need all the details all at once. But sometimes, just like in software development, you will get bugs or inconsistencies with this kind of world building methodology. And don't worry, there is a solution for that too, which we will get to later in this video. But before I write a single world of world building, I start by answering some foundational questions that go into my starting point of my Bible. These provide the groundwork for the world I'm about to build. If I don't have these answers, I cannot ensure consistency and depth as I iteratively develop the world. These act as my guideposts. They direct my world building process and help me to avoid narrative detours that don't fit within the world I've set out to create. So the five fundamental questions that I always address are the following. One, what are the inhabitants of this world like? Are they human, completely alien, a mix of races from standard fantasy, or something else entirely? Understanding what kind of sentient beings live in my world not only impacts the narrative, but also the structure of societies, cultures, and interactions. Two, what is the technology level? Is it a primitive society, medieval world, modern landscape, renaissance, futuristic, gas lamp? What am I looking at? The technology level will affect everything from daily life to warfare, economy, and the scope of exploration in the world. 
A primitive society based in the Stone Age is not going to have massive trade routes, so I don't need to build them. So think carefully about the level of your technology and if you need some help establishing kind of what that technology level is and what could be going on during that time period, I do have my Eras Defined video, which you can check out in the playlists. Okay, back to those questions. My third question is what kind of a magic system is there, if any? If magic exists, how does it work? Who can use it and what are its limitations? A well-defined magic system can be a unique selling point for your world and inform a lot of narrative conflict. If you have no magic system that is equally as important, it is important to understand how much magic is present in your world as a guiding light to your world building. If it's a lot, you need to build magic in at, the, at a technology level, like a ubiquitous thing, as I spoke about in my video on ubiquitous magic. If it's not a lot, if it's a very magic light world, you need to know that too, so that you can focus more on emphasizing that it is the equivalent technology level of our age, of that kind of world, etc. So you're going to put a focus in different areas from magic. So that's a magic system. But there is also this. What is the effect of the fantastical on the environment? And I very specifically phrase it like this. The fantastical, not necessarily magic. Because, for example, you could be building a science fiction world and you could use something like supersymmetry radiation as a form of magic. Like, it is an unpredictable science that we don't understand. And you can use that as a type of magic. And there aren't people who use supersymmetry radiation. But its effect on the world has created a fantastical effect. It has created, through evolution, creatures that are adapted to supersymmetry radiation being prevalent on the world. So, what fantastical elements exist in your world that affect the environment of your world. My fifth question is, what is the socio-political structure of the kingdom I'm currently working with? And is there anything around it which is a different socio-political structure? So by socio-political structure, I mean things like, is it a monarchy, a democracy, a theocracy, or some other system? Understanding this will inform not just the story's larger political intrigues, but also the day-to-day -day lives of the characters. You kind of have to have at least a basic idea of how the government works. So answering these five questions provides a solid foundation upon which I can build and expand my world as the narrative develops. It creates a broad understanding of the world so that every new detail I add feels coherent and grounded. So once I've answered these questions and I have this basic ideas, I start building characters. This is the nexus of my world exploration. Each character is a representative of their societal status, occupation, and experiences. They serve as the eyes and ears of the reader, but also as my eyes and ears as the world builder. Through the characters, I experience the world's texture, contradictions, and challenges. So when I'm creating a character, I pants that first chapter of theirs, their introduction, like raw. I have no real idea of where I'm going with a character at that point. And the reason for that is this process embeds me in the mindset of the character. And once I'm in their mindset, I can describe how they interact with the world. At this point, they do not yet have anything to interact with. But as I build them, as I write their chapter, they will explore the world and that will lead me to create the parts of the world that I need them to interact with. I, I get that that sounds a little chaotic and it is a bit, but let me take an example from Sangwheel Chronicles, which is probably my most well-defined world at the moment. So, I built a character who, had, who was a noble and who had to interact with other nobles. 
and I needed a way for that character to understand the family and rank of the people that he was interacting with. This led me to the creation of my noble rank item, which was the noble sash, which was at first just a sash of multiple different colors, depending on your rank as a noble, with a badge of your family on it. As the characters and the story evolved, this sash took on a life of its own. It became more than a piece of clothing. It turned into a symbol, reflecting the character's status and influencing societal interactions. People started referring to nobles as the sashed, suggesting a distinct separation between them and commoners, known as those before the sash. This dictimony created a social tension that I could explore throughout the narrative. Furthermore, the noble sash brought forth a whole lexicon of idioms and sayings enriching the world's cultural fabric. For instance, the phrase, hiding behind the sash, represents the act of a noble hiding behind their status or letting another noble defend them. I also invented a unique form of honor duels called the tassel duel, where nobles could defend their honor in a formalized confrontation. All of these intricate details were born from a simple question, what can my noble character wear to show his rank? Every detail, every piece of clothing, every idiom can become a launch pad for deeper exploration and enrichment of the world you're building. So for another example, you might have a character that's a mage. The clothing they wear, the tools they use, and their behavior would inform the development of the magic system. How do mages interact with magic? Do they have specialized clothing or accessories? Answering these questions through the lens of a character can lend to the creation of magical artifacts, the codification of spells, and the formation of mage guilds or academies. These characters and their narratives become the keystones that shape and expand the world, infusing it with depth and vibrancy. The agile world-building process, with its focus on characters, allows the world to unfold organically, catering to the story's needs and maintaining a high level of engagement. So between the initial setup from my five questions and some of the very basic character explorations, I generate a world bible that is any, anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 words long. It is a fairly broad brush strokes document, not diving into too much detail. So my first entry in the world bible for the sash, for example, just said the nobles wear different color sashes to indicate their rank and there is a badge of their family on the sash as well. That was all it said about the sashes, because it was a very simple entry into the world Bible. And then as I expanded on it, it got its own entry in a separate OneNote page, because I use OneNote a lot. So it got a, a separate OneNote entry page that detailed exactly the tassel duel and how the different ranks work and what ranks can be indicated on the sash and so on. And that is how I go from broad brush strokes to in-depth. So let's talk about iterative refinement. The agile world building process is just like a sculpture chiseling a block of stone. It starts with a broad outline and gradually through refinement and iteration, the minute details take shape. So building on your initial world building Bible, as the narrative unfolds, the world expands and evolves, guided by that framework as your true north. The first stage involves setting up your key elements. Again, pulling on Sangwill Chronicles, I knew I didn't want to use conventional timekeeping. Thus, I introduced the idea of a candle clock. Initially, the notes were very simple. It said they use a candle clock. As the story progressed, this concept evolved. It started generating idioms like, you can't stick the wax back on the candle, which is analogous to, you can't turn back time. It also led to the establishment of an entire guild dedicated to candle clock making and jobs like candle keepers who ensure that the candles stay lit at the appropriate times. 
When I then expanded my world to the southern continent of Kisangi, I chose to use a water clock in order to differentiate it from the northern continent. This choice inspired a whole new set of idioms and cultural quirks. Thus, the simple concept of timekeeping expanded into a rich cultural component that varied across different regions. Another instance of this iterative process is visible in my work on the fragmented saga, which I'm co-authoring with Maxwell Alexander Drake. Here, in my initial note of the first book, Magic Fall, it just said they worship a being called the Builder, and this faith believes that order should always have just a little bit of chaos. That line expanded into a complex religious system with varied expressions, curses, blessings, rituals, and a profound societal impact but only when I needed to have priests present in the narrative. Even in urban fantasy this works. In an urban fantasy world I'm working on, and a story I'm working on, I created a druid character who holds rank within a magical organization called the Sentinels. There was a simple note next to it that says, like the US Marshals, but worldwide and for magic. This has evolved into a fully-fledged institution with symbols of rank and authority. The pin they wore, initially noted as a pin that can become a wand, gradually transformed into a detailed magical item with a rich backstory and functionality that is now known as a beacon of the balance. These examples encapsulate the agile world-building process, starting with a simple note or idea and then gradually expanding it, enhancing its complexity and enriching its detail as the narrative develops. The process is organic and dynamic and it allows the world to grow and adapt in sync with a story. Each iterative refinement ensures that the world is deep and diverse and engaging, making the narrative much more compelling. But you always return to your keynotes that you set up initially. This forms your true north. Whatever you build has to fit with that Bible of simple ideas. Except sometimes that is really hard. So let's talk about handling leaks. As with any dynamic organic process, the agile world building method isn't immune to the occasional leak. Instances where I realized that a certain element needs a different treatment or wasn't defined in the way the story now needs it. I call these leaks. If it was software, I might call them bugs. Rather than treating these as flaws, I see them as opportunities, moments that spark creativity and add depth to my world. The process of handling leaks involves redefinition and retrofitting that turns these flaws into water fountains. They are creative solutions that patch the leak while adding a layer of interest and complexity to the world. For example, in Sangwheel Chronicles, halfway through the second book, I realized I had a leak. The spiritual order in the empire, the monks of Vero, consisted only of men. I had inadvertently overlooked the role of women in the her religious hierarchy. I'd literally just completely ignored my own gender. So, what to do? To handle this, instead of resorting to some sort of tradition like women can't be part of the religion or whatever, I created a secret order of female monks dedicated to the temple and serving the temple as assassins. This new undercover order of women because they are trained as temple assassins, not only patched the leak, but also added a fascinating twist to the story. In the first book, I'd had a female assassin that was a name and that the reader didn't know, but I did know, that she had been hired by the monks. So when I decided to do this, I just changed hired by the monks to belongs to the church. And instantly, I patched my leak of no woman in Vero, and I created a very interesting element of my world. But the trick with these leaks is always to remember you must still stay within your Bible. 
Because if you don't, you will end up with a mess. You'll end up with everything going everywhere. You need to have that direction that you are building towards, that true guiding north. If you've enjoyed this discussion so far, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about alternative Earth worlds. Here is my cat who really wants to say hello. So, internet, meet D'Artagnan. D'Artagnan, there you go, my boy. That's what it looks like. Now, so far, we've been talking about second world development. So, basically, not really connected to Earth world building. But even when you're crafting worlds that intersect with our own, like urban fantasy or alternative history or whatnot, the approach remains the same. But the world building Bible must incorporate a slightly different set of details. So for these alternative earth worlds, I record the real world locations and time period. And then I note the changes that I make to earth's history. I identify the elements that remain untouched and flag areas where I will apply subtle tweaks rather than wholesale changes. To illustrate that, let's talk about that urban fantasy that I spoke about, which is set in contemporary Las Vegas. Most of Las Vegas stays as is, but there is a hidden world that exists alongside the one we know, and mages hide who they are. When I constructed this hidden world, I needed to justify its secrecy, as I spoke about in my urban fantasy world building video. So, at first, my world bible just said, they were witch trials and they drove all mages underground. But then I started writing a little and I needed a better motivation for my character to get involved in the mystery. So I expanded on that definition. I said there was an age of dissonance after the Roman Empire fell. It ended with a magical realm being pushed into secrecy and a council being created that governs the use of magic and there's an enforcement arm that enforces the the secrecy and the character as part of this. But as the story progressed, I needed still more history of this age of dissonance. I needed to understand what had happened here. And so I turned to our history and came up with these tweaks for events around the age of dissonance. In the middle of the 5th century AD, the Roman Empire collapsed. So far, so good. This is standard. But In my universe, this also triggered the age of dissonance for the European fairies. This era began as the influence of the Roman Empire faded and the fairies basically took over large parts of human civilization. This led to a tumultuous dark ages in Europe and as fairy courts around the world responded to Europe because the fairies could engage in full-blown continental travel, they started to either imitate the European fairies in taking over mortal realms, or they resisted the uh, spread of this European fairy you know, invasion of mortal realms. So I asked myself, how would that have affected the rest of the world during the century known as the Age of Dissonance? So these are high-level entries because I don't need the detail yet. But these high-level entries are the Asian magical entities deeply rooted in the philosophies like Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism championed balance and harmony. But the onslaught of European dissonance swayed some of them to chaos, inciting magical upheavals and periods of imbalance. Over time, the ripples of dissonance reached the relatively isolated Americas, disturbing the magic that is deeply rooted and tied to nature and the multitude of spirits and magical creatures. Despite the disruptions, the land's powerful connection to magic acted as a stabilizing force. In Africa, with its rich culture of diversity, had had unique relationships with magical entities. The initial impact of European dissonance was minimal. However, with the expansion of trade routes, the European magical chaos chaos influence spread, inciting turmoil in certain regions and inspiring new forms of magic in others. 
For the Pacific Islands and Australia, magic was fundamentally tied to the ocean, sky, and dream time. The European dissonance led to increased unpredictability in the manifestation of magic, but the region's strong cultural and spiritual ties curbed outright chaos. The age of dissonance eventually lessened, particularly with the rise of Christianity in Europe. The new religion acted as a unifying force for mortals suppressing dissonant magic and advocating for unity and peace. The pivotal event that marked the end of the age and the beginning of the age of secrecy was the Battle of Constantinople in 537 AD. This was a catastrophic confrontation between humans and fairies rather than a siege by the Ostrogoths in my world. Following an unexpected turn of events, Queen Mab of the Unseelie Court agreed to a truce known as the Pact. The Pact marked the end of the Age of Dissonance, giving way to an era of relative peace and cooperation. So again, it's iterative world building, but in Old Earth world building, you do have the vast basis of our history to include. You just need to think about how you're going to include it and make sure your notes include what stays untouched, what is tweaked, and what is wholesale changed. And that's my take on world building. That's my agile world building process in a nutshell. In my opinion, it's a flexible and dynamic approach that allows your world to grow organically through the story and through the characters. What do you think of it? Have you tried agile world building? Do you try and build everything up front? How do you approach it? If you've enjoyed this video, do check out how to build a fantasy history, and please do give this video a thumbs up. If you found real value in it, consider joining the channel for these cool perks or giving this video a super thanks. And if you want my help in building your world, you can hit my Ko-fi page to engage my services there. And I will see you soon for another video from Just In Time World.